Then he gave his citizenship up in Yankee land and came down to the south. And I, I would say that both sections of the country benefited from that. <laughs> <laughs> but he's been retooled. He's got a new transmission, so <laughs> he made it here. Uh, he's been preaching for uh, quite some time. He was in the Navy at one time. And the Navy decided that they could do with less personnel. He went to Florida School of Preaching under the late B.C. Carr, uh, preaching congregations in Florida, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Alabama, Louisiana, and now uh, preaches at the Indianola, or the church in Indianola. What's the street? What's the? Indianola Church of Christ. Indianola Church of Christ. Is the street light still working? Is the street light, is it still working? <laughs> Every other Thursday. Every other Thursday. <laughs> but anyway, the proud uh, parents of one son, uh, Justin, uh, is he still in China? Yeah, he's just gone, gone leaving back there this morning. Oh, come, come back this morning. Uh, but uh, again, he's uh, spoke, uh, spoken on our lectureship. We certainly value the comments that he is. Uh, given us in the past, and we look forward to the uh, presentation this this afternoon. And it is Christ confronted era about the end of time. Let's come speak to us. So that's the end, the end of time. Then I tell people I wasn't born here, but I got here as soon as I could after I found out about it. Uh, I didn't didn't leave anything back up home to go back looking for I get homesick every once in a while and say well yeah I really like to move up home and then I talked to one of my friends they just shoveled six inches of snow and I said Psh, no Christ confronted error about the end times one of the biggest challenges in my opinion we face in discussing Bible with friends neighbors and relatives and and even fellow Christians based upon Bible studies you teach is to get them to simply read the words of the text and to get them to take those words that they read in their common everyday meaning as if you saw them in a newspaper, saw those same words in a newspaper, and understand them in their common everyday context, unless there's something um, that, that needs to be considered in regards to the context. Context is crucial and should always be taken into consideration if we expect to understand what is being said and revealed to us. It should also be understood that every word is to be taken literally unless a literal meaning would render the passage meaningless, meaningless or otherwise confusing. Consider the two examples we have found in Luke chapter 13 and John chapter 10. In Luke we find Jesus calling Herod a fox and John, in John Jesus claims to be a door. Now, if we took these two instances literally, the passage would be rendered absurd and the meaning obscured at best. Was Jesus a door? Was Her if you saw Herod, would you see a little four-footed, red fur-covered dog-looking thing? Or would you see, some what did he mean by calling Herod a fox and labeling himself a door? Uh, unless we understand that they're figurative, then we'll not understand what's being discussed there. Uh, Jesus just simply used these descriptive words in a figurative manner. The lesson that we must be careful to discern between literal and figurative meanings in order, that, the lesson is that we must dis be careful to discern between these two in order to learn the lessons given to us by the Spirit from God's mind. To discuss end times from a biblical perspective is to begin to have a conversation about eschatology. That's just a big word. It doesn't, and it's not, shouldn't be confusing. It's defined as the branch of theology that is concerned with the ultimate or last things such as death. By the doctrine of the last things is meant that the ideas entertained at any period uh, on the future life, the end of the world, the resurrection judgment in the New Testament, the parousia, and the eternal destinies of mankind. You know, what are people thinking about this stuff? And that's what we're talking about when we talk about eschatology. Now, while we are concerned about what, with what people think at any given time, what our concerns, what concern is currently here 
is what does the Bible tell us about end time? That's, that's the consideration. What does the Bible say about it? And what is it that has been revealed to us from the mind of God? 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You know, when you stop and think about it, brethren, now obviously I have a New Testament here, but what I have here is in my hand is the revealed mind of an infinite God who has determined that is what, in, that is what is in the page, on the page of this book is sufficient for me to live here as he would have me to live and then to prepare myself for life and eternity around his throne. I have God's mind here. Now, why, why don't we open it up and read it more often than apparently what some of us do? Because we're, we don't really want to know what's there because once I learn what's there, I have to change who and what I am. The perspective of this lesson is that God has revealed to my, mankind his mind in such a way that man can know, understand, and be responsible for knowing what it says and then obeying all the Bible commands us to do. Jesus said, the words that I have spoken shall judge you in the last day. If that doesn't make us stop to pause and reconsider our lives, and I'm not sure what we could say to them that would, that would cause someone to, to then begin to reflect. But this truth is demonstrated when Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And I think that's just been cited in about every lesson so far in this series of lectures. Teaching us that uh, the, this, this, it, it teaches us that human spiritual sanctification is indeed possible, that I can be sanctified, that I can live a life that is characterized as one having been sanctified, and continue doing so. During the Jerusalem conference on the necessity to circumcise Gentile converts to Christianity, Peter states, and God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Acts 15, verses 8 and 9. The apostle goes on to explain to us that ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now we learn from this that there is a body of doctrine revealed from God which we are able to understand and obey, and in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, Paul says we can have the same mind on that subject, that we can all agree on it. Now, the question I've been asked before is why don't we? Well, that's not the purpose of this lesson, but I just tell you it's a carnal mind, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And when we talk about the end of time, the lesson applies with equal force. Just as we can hear and understand and learn what the Spirit says about salvation in the same manner we can hear, understand, and learn what the Spirit says about the end time. And we ought to. We better. Now the Bible affirms that there will be an end of time. Now Jesus recognized the validity of the creation account when he used Genesis chapter 2, 18 and following as validation for his doctrinal marriage as contained in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. Specifically, Jesus says in verse 11 of Matthew 19, Have ye not read that he which made them from the beginning made them male and female? Now, the material universe had a specific beginning possessing a number of characteristics, one of which was that it wasn't designed to be permanent. This is not designed to be permanent. We know that vegetation of very kind, various kinds were designed for long life because it was designed for food. Let me tell you, if a carrot has been designed for food, it has not been designed to last very long. Genesis chapter 1, verses 29 and 30. Now man's longevity was affected by access to the tree of life. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9. Now when access to the tree of life was interdicted, man began to physically die. And then you can see the, 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 the descent of the, age of the, the ages of men when they died. And this man lived to be this old and so forth. As time went on, they, the, the, the span of their years became less and less. Now the Bible teaches us that there will be a total destruction of the material universe at some future time. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Hebrews chapter 10, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10 and 12. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, 
Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. He knows he's not affected by time. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. It's all going to be gone. It won't be here. This event will be catastrophic in nature, resulting in a total destruction and annihilation of the material universe. The material creation won't be purified. Rather, it will be caused to no longer exist in any form. In other words, what will be is what will be before the, before the foundation of the world began. There won't be anything of a material nature. In Psalms 102, verse 25, the psalmist tells us this. He contrasts. The abiding nature of God with that of an old garment that is changed. God endures. The material work of his hands does not. As the creation had a physical beginning from nothing, so shall its physical existence cease altogether. It just won't be anymore. Now, will there be signs of troublesome times signaling, signaling the end of time? Now, when Ken comes up here in a few minutes, that will be the end of time for me as far as this sermon goes. And many today read Jesus' words in Matthew 24 and draw the unwarranted conclusion that there will be clear and easily understood signs warning of the second coming of Christ. Now truth be told, Jesus does indeed discuss signs of times and events and does discuss his second coming. But he does not connect any signs with his return. Remember we said just a moment ago, as a thief in the knife, I... In the night, I've, I worked as a county jailer years ago, and I didn't know of any of those guys that ever got caught doing what they did, called up beforehand and said, by the way, I'll be over shortly. Uh, I'm not saying they weren't dumb enough to do it. They just probably didn't think of it. I don't know. The context for Matthew chapter 24 begins back in chapter 21, 18, and for our, purpose, our, our purposes here, ends at Matthew 25 and 46. Now, and we're not going to get everything in there, but that's the context of it. The activities and the conversations contained in this section in which Jesus participated set this scene of chapter 24 as well as help us to grasp the importance of the judgment scene ending in chapter 25. Jesus gives us three parables in this section that are necessary for understanding. There's the parable of the two sons, Matthew 21, it was mentioned earlier this morning. The parable of the wicked husbandman, again in chapter 21 and 32. And the marriage of the king's son in chapter 22, the first 14 verses. In the parable of the two sons, Jesus makes the point that the Jews refused the preaching of Jesus and John on the coming kingdom and refused to repent, while the tax collectors and the sinners did hear and responded with repentance unlike their leaders. Consider Matthew chapter 3. There's John out there in the, in the wilderness baptizing and everybody from Jerusalem troops out there. John looks up and sees the Pharisees coming and... <laughs> He just laid into them. Who told you to flee from the wrath to come? Called them vipers. Now, that's not very loving. I mean, that's going to drive somebody away. Or it's the loving truth that they needed to hear, as, as Brother David pointed out the other night. They needed to be brought up short. They needed to be showed that not everybody thought of them as they thought of themselves. Um, in the the... the the lesson of the parable of the wicked husband is that the Jews will lose their vineyard as well as their lives, and the whole householder will let the vineyard out to others, which again irritated them no end. The Jews understood that Jesus was referring to them and took counsel to lay hands on him, Matthew 20, 21 45. The parable of the marriage of the king's son teaches us at least that those bidden that refuse the invitation will be judged unworthy. Uh, they've judged themselves unworthy. We also learn that one's spiritual attire is important. You know, what, 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 what's the spiritual robe you are wearing? What's it look like? Is it, is it wrinkled and spotted and torn by sin, or has it been purified? Now, these parables condemn the Jewish leaders, and again, these men knew it. Now, in chapter 23, Jesus pronounces a series of eight woes on the Jewish, Jewish elites, which excoriated them and their practices. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Man, he, he just tore into him. In verse 34 through 36, Jesus extends 
what amounts to one more opportunity to repent and to come to God or they're going to suffer the consequences of all of Israel's disobedience and the rejection of God's prophets. It's all going home, coming home to rest on top of them. Jesus warns them in verse 36 that the lack of turning to God will bring the blood of all the prophets down on those to whom he was speaking. And Jesus closes this chapter with his lament over the hardened and carnal hearts of the Jews and what it would bring down on them. You might want to also note Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8, and 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. That's the carnal mind for you. It's just an immature mind that won't accept the truth. Jesus begins Matthew 24 with a statement about the coming destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. The disciples being understandably upset. Now there you are. You're one of the Jews that are standing there and you've just been told that the center of your religious universe is going to be destroyed. Now, that would get your attention. I mean, that would get your attention. If somebody came in here and said, by the way, this building is going to be burnt down tonight. Well, excuse me, let's hear some more explanation about that. Just exactly what do you mean? Disciples, understandably upset, ask him four distinct questions according to McGarvey. And McGarvey lists them as, when shall the temple be destroyed? What shall be the signs which precede its destruction? What shall be the sign of Christ's coming? What shall be the sign of the end of the world? Brother Bulls says there are three points of inquiry. Namely, when shall these things be? What is the sign of thy coming? What is the sign of the end of the world? The three th points then are these. Are, are these things thy coming and the end of the world? Which again is an important discussion. When you really, really boil these points down, the disciples wanted to know when the temple would be destroyed and when would Jesus return. I think you can sum them up that way. The signs of pending destruction of the temple are defined with the last and most important, very well defined. They are very well defined. When is the temple going to be destroyed? I'm going to tell you. It's this, this, and this. Look for these specific signs. The initial sign of approaching destruction of that is false Christ appearing to perform great signs and wonders. And again, you could look at Acts chapter 8, verse 9, Simon the sorcerer. I mean, he's, that's part of the process. The next sign in order is that, in order is that of a military nature. Now, while there are no New Testament references to these wars, history does tell us of the political turmoil in the rapid succession of the Roman emperors. Um, Nero was emperor for about 14 years. Galba was for about two years. Otho and Vitellus were some kind of a co-regents. Daniel 2 and verse 33, in describing the statue, just recognizes the political instability of Rome, even though the Pax Romana, the, the peace that lasted from 27 B.C. to about 180, 180 A.D., that there was still instability in the kingdom in the Roman Empire. The next sign reference would be that of the great natural calamities of which we do have a New Testament reference in Acts chapter 11, verse 28. There's going to be a great dearth in, in, uh, in Judea, according to the prophet Agabus. And the brethren uh, collected up some money and sent it down there. The fourth and last sign would be that of the persecution of Christians. Now Paul lists the things which he endured. And you could look at all the things uh, that he endured in his career as a, as a gospel minister. James was killed, uh, killed and Peter in prison in Acts chapter 12. Uh, Jesus gives yet another indication of, for time keeping and that the gospel would need to be published throughout the world. And not until then would the world... Uh, would the, would the end come? Uh, chapter 24, 14, especially Colossians 1 and 23. Now, you know, you get into big discussions to how, how far ranging into all the world actually means, but whatever it meant, it was accomplished, according to Colossians 1 and 23. The final clincher on this is, quote, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, from Matthew 24, 15. Now, one writer asserts that this pictures the Romans in Judea. In other words, Judea was a holy place and a holy land, and the Gentiles weren't supposed to be there, even though they'd been there for quite some time. And this writer claims that's it. And another, those same Romans in the temple itself. Now, I tell you, before the Romans can get into the temple, they're going to have to be on the ground outside of it. So, you know, it's six one half a dozen the other it's still not a good deal for anybody concerned at that time. The events leading up to and following the event prophesied would be catastrophic. For the Jewish world, for the Jewish religion, as they practiced it then, it would be the final straw on the back of the camel that collapsed the whole system. By the way, whatever it is that's practiced today by Jews isn't the Old Testament process. They can't do it. There's no temple, there's no priesthood, 
They, they, they don't even know who is a member of which tribe. It's just a mess. Now, Jesus again uses the fig tree in a parable to instruct his disciples in the art of discerning the biblical signs given by Jesus. They could look at the new growth on the fig tree and know that summer is near. Just so, when they saw the previously discussed signs, they would know that the destruction of the temple would be near. Jesus probably astounded them when he said, Verily I say unto you, this generation, you fellows, shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. You who are standing here are going to see it, he's telling them. Those of that generation, standing there, listening to Jesus, would live to see the, the signs and the destruction. Jesus then promised them on his own word that it would happen, according to verse 35. But Jesus now dealt with the destruction of the temple, as well as providing signs to indicate when they should expect to see that destruction, as they had asked. He now turns to the time of his triumphant return in verses 36 through 51. And again, I want to stress this idea of just reading the words that are there. If people won't read those words and understand them in their everyday common context as if they were reading a newspaper, they're not going to understand it. If they bring their own viewpoint, their own world view to these words and try to, try to, to scrunch the words of the Bible into, to fit their world view, they're not going to get it. Try, but they're not going to get it. If one refuses to accept or understand the plain words of the Lord in verses 36 through 41, then that person will, would be a true example of the wayside soil in Luke chapter 8 and verse 12. And, and again, how does the devil come and take the word away? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's how he does it. Note especially verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now what do those words mean? Who knew? Who knew? Who could know? Who could understand? Who could grasp when the end would be? Well, my Father only. Well, that doesn't mean my Father only, according to some people in the books I've read by them. It means my father only and a whole bunch of the rest of us. Well, that's, that's just ignoring the words. But that's their worldview. If we are to interpret these words in their common everyday meaning, then the only rational conclusion, and there's the issue right there, the rational conclusion, to be drawn is that the knowledge of the exact time of Jesus' second coming is known only by the Heavenly Father. And I would suggest that holds true today. One of these days, Jehovah is going to turn to His Son and say, now is the time. And then it's going to start, as far as we're concerned. Now if it doesn't mean that, then I, I'm stumped as to what it does mean, because just looking at the words, that's all you can come up with. Remember the lesson of the fig tree. That there are signs of the approaching growing season? Jesus tells us that such signs will not be available in order to determine that his second coming is nigh. Is there a fig tree with leaves coming out of it indicating some are not in context of Jesus' second coming? Please read verses 37 through 39. No one knew the exact timing of the flood except the Father. Regardless of Noah's preaching, only his family, heated and the residue of humanity and creation were swept away in spite of life's daily events. Why didn't they listen to Noah? Well, building a big boat like that was probably crazy for those people at that time. They just wouldn't listen. And then the clouds came and the rain came down. In view of the sudden advent of the Lord, our lives should be lived in expectation of his return. How are you living? How is your daily life being led? What is your standard by judging whether it's acceptable or not? All these things need to be answered. And this all is a lesson of verses 42 through 44. In view of that suddenness, our lives are be characterized as that of the wise servant in verses 45 through 47. And to avoid the lifestyle, it'll illustrated by that of the evil servant in verses 48 through 51. Don't do this, do that. Well, how hard is that to, to, to do? Well, apparently it's extremely difficult for some people, for most people as a matter of fact. The need for preparation is illustrated by the account of the ten virgins in Matthew chapter 25, the first 13 verses, the distributed talents and the distributed talents in verses 14 through 30. Briefly, we ought to always be immediately ready for the bridegroom's return and the appropriate use of our blessings until the Lord's return for accounting. He gave it to us and said, now occupy till I come. 
And by the way, you're not even in charge of you. You don't own you. Your spirit, God gave you to yourself is the best way I can describe it. He said, now occupy till I come. You use yourself for the glory of God until I come back and I'm going to hold you accountable for how you use the resources I gave you. And then we can't get people to lead in prayer and lead songs and so forth. In view of the coming judgment, it is truly astonishing at how just at how just how important the mundane events of daily life become. Consider upon what the two groups of Matthew 25, 31 and following were judged, with some being found worthy, verses 35 and 36, and the others unworthy, verses 42 and 43. What was done for one to either receive the Lord's invitation to live eternal, or condemnation to everlasting punishment is breaking the two greatest commandments given in Matthew 22. Love the Lord thy God with all the heart, mind, and soul, and thy neighbor as thyself. Demonstrating our love for God through our treatment of our fellow man. Think of the rich man and Lazarus in, uh, in Luke chapter 16. Now, we have no account that the rich man threw stones at Lazarus, kicked him on the way out the gate, sicked his dogs on him, ch had him be chased away by his servant. None of that. He just ignored him. Just ignored him. That's all he did. Just ignored him. Apparently that was all it took. Or the rich farmer in Luke chapter 12 didn't say the man cheated on his taxes. Didn't say he did anything other than didn't share what he had and didn't take God into consideration with the blessings. And he said, behold what I have done. Kind of sounds like the king of Babylon, doesn't it? Look what I have gotten me. And the voice said, this day. Hold him accountable. Both of these were condemned. Both of those condemned were guilty of not demonstrating love for God through their lack of care for their fellow man. How, how hard is it to be good to people? How hard is it to be good to people? Just be good to people. Now there's more to it than that, but that's the beginning of it. Now, does the New Testament teach that the second coming of Christ is imminent? John and Jesus both taught the need for repentance in review of the fact that the coming of the prophesied kingdom was imminent. And that's, that's been discussed already. By imminent, we mean to say that something is about to incur or is impending. Does the New Testament teach that the second coming of Christ was to occur or was otherwise impending in nature at that point from their perspective? The answer is no, it does not. It does not teach that. We know this to be the case simply because it has, as of yet, not occurred. Now, in spite of what some of our brethren claim that the, that the second coming has already taken place, and I believe Brother Billingsley taught that in some of his false doctrine, uh, it hasn't happened yet. At least, not that I can tell, and somebody needs to send me the memo if it has. Um, now, it is my particular word view that the Holy Spirit spoke as directed by God. Again, that's already been mentioned. John chapter 14, 26 and 15, 26 and 27. We ought to simply read and understand the simple words given to us by the Holy Spirit. When I read what they wrote, Paul says I can understand his understanding. Now think about that. When I read what he wrote, a four and a few words, I can have the apostles' understanding of the subject he's discussing. When I read what the apostles recorded, I can know what God told them because they told me what they, told, what they were told. Now... Again, what's the problem with that? Well, like, that can't be true. Well, it can be. It, you just don't accept it as being true. Um, I lost my place. Um, let's see. Okay. Paul understood that Jesus wouldn't come during his own earthly sojourn. He knew that. He, at least he taught that. We know this because he prophesied of things to happen after his own passing from this plane of existence. Now the Holy Spirit inspired him to say this. For I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. How did he know that? The Spirit told him that. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. After them. So Paul knew that this would take place after his death. So he knew that Jesus wouldn't come until sometime after his death and these events took place. It would at least be that long. The apostle knew that Jesus wouldn't come during his lifetime, but that there were some that there were but that there some were some things that would take place after his lifetime that would happen before the return. Note the Lord's prophecy of Peter's manner of death. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou hast when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. 
But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. In other words, live like I have lived. And Peter's understanding of his death, knowing this shortly, I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. 2 Peter 1.14 Neither one of these men understood, much less taught, that Jesus was coming soon, whether it was morning or night or noon. They did not see any signs of his return. If anybody would have, surely these guys would have. But they didn't. They didn't tell us that they did. Matter of fact, they told us they didn't see any signs. We've looked briefly at the passages dealing with the signs and, and what times they presaged. These signs would indicate the impending doom of Jerusalem and the temple were imminent. There would be no signs to enable us to discern the king's second advent. When is Jesus going to come? Don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But what does it say? Get ready for he's coming. The events at the end of time are apparently simultaneously, simultaneous in occurrence or so close together as to be, of, to be so in appearance. It just seemed to all happen at the same time. And somebody says, well, what happened? It just all happened at once. Well, no, it didn't. It just seemed like it. You ever wrecked a motorcycle? Pretty much the way it seems. It just happens all at once. You say, oh no, and there you are. Been there. The events at the end of time are apparently simultaneous in occurrence. But what are, what are at least some of these events to accompany the end of time and the judgment of all souls? We can expect to see Jesus coming in the clouds. This advent, by the way, all eyes shall see him, even the ones that pierced him. There has to be a resurrection, doesn't there? This advent will be accompanied by great sounds as in the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. The noise of the destruction of the material universe. Have you, have you ever heard a, a fire of some kind of a structure? I, there was a, back up home when I was a boy, there was a, a, a refinery of some sort. They refined paint thinner and lacquer and stuff, and that place caught on fire. Man, I'd pay to see that all over again. That was spectacular. You could hear it a half a mile away. You could hear the roar of that thing a half a mile away. That was, that was, that was the best set of fireworks I've ever seen in my life. Uh, dangerous nonetheless. The noise of destruction of the material universe. That's what you're going to hear. You're going to hear something like that. And it'll be so, it'll be so amazing, so overwhelming that we're going to hope for the rocks that are being destroyed to fall on folks. The anguished voices of the unrighteous shall be heard. All of those in the grave shall come forth. On the last day, changed in the twinkling of an eye, and judged, the righteous are taken up to heaven, and the unrighteous sent to everlasting punishment. All apparently, in, in such a compacted form, it's going to appear to be all at once. How ought we to think and then live in regards to all of these things? Heed the words of the Apostle Peter when he said, Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of, of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, in keeping with his promise, and harmony with his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, where's that going to be? It's not going to be on this earth. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. That sounds pretty much like Matthew chapter 24 when you think about it. How is it, and, and chapter 25 when you tack that on too, how is it we're supposed to be in all holy manner of conversation, be as he is, so that when he appears, we will be as he will be. What must I do to avoid the calamity that will befall the unrighteous at Jesus' next appearance? Well, the course of action is clear if once again, if we once again resolve to read the words of Jesus and simply do what he commands. Jesus said in order to have eternal... Now, I had an instructor of mine at school say that when he was preaching for a congregation down in Miami, Florida, there is a, a two-year junior college down there that's run by some religious group. I, I don't even know what it's called now. But he was, they were studying comparative religions. They came to the Church of Christ and they asked Brother Arlen to show up and, and talk about the church. So what he did is he's got to the plan of salvation. Now the, the, the instructor was sitting over here on a stool and Arlen's standing in front of the class and he's got a chalkboard up there and he came to the plan of salvation and the, and the professor made some comment about it. So Arlen went over back to the chalkboard and wrote down here, 
as I'm going to give you here in just a moment, he said, here, John 6, 44 and 45, there should be written in the prophets. And then, Jesus, and then he wrote down, believe. that Je He wrote down, first of all, at the top, Jesus said. So Jesus said at the top, here, John 6, 44 and 45. Then he wrote down, believe, John 8 and verse 32, right next to it. And then he came over and he wrote down, repent, Luke 13, 3. And confess, Matthew 10, 32. And be immersed, Mark 16, 16. And live faithfully, Revelation 2 and verse 10. And the kids are looking at Arlen, they're looking at the professor, they're looking at Arlen like a, like a ping pong match. And Arlen writes him up there and the professor says, well, I don't believe you have to do all that. Arlen handed, he reached out the eraser and said, well, professor, come up here and you erase out the words of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that are not important in one salvation. And the kids looked at Arlen and looked at the professor and the professor just sat there. Well, that's the only rational thing he could do. And when he did that, he gave up the argument. Because when Jesus tells us what to do, hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and live faithfully, then if I do that, I'm going to be what Jesus wants me to be. He's going to put me where he wants me put. Luke, uh, Acts 2 and verse 47, the Lord added to the church, daily such as should be saved. What church is that? The one that he purchased with his own blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. When we do the things that Jesus said to do, we will become that pure, sanctified, and holy group of people that we ought to be. We'll continue living in such a manner that when Christ comes again, we will meet him in the air with the saints that have gone on before, that have been resurrected, and there shall we ever be with the Lord. Our lives consist of the choices we make. All of us right here, right now, those listening, those going to hear this later on, later on today, later on next week, later on in the future, they read the book, all of this. The fact is, is that we are who we are today because of the choices we made up to this point in time. At this time tomorrow afternoon, we'll be the persons, persons we will be based upon the decisions we've made between now and then. What do you decide to do? How do you decide to live? How do you decide to think? That's who you will be. Our lives consist of the choices we make. Our eternal destiny hinges on those same decisions. If you understand your responsibility to yourself and the Lord Jesus Christ, it would serve you well to consider his words and then act in faith. I thank you for your time and your attention.